SLD අලුත් මෙගා ලයින් කනෙක්ෂන් වලට 150ක දීම නා තවත් ඔෆර් ගැන දැනගන්න 1 2 1 2 2 අමතන්න Word of caution. The Human Rights Watch urges Sri Lanka to continue the moratorium on capital punishment. The Dubai Raid. Two more from the Dubai drug bus deported to Sri Lanka. The police, however, silent on Mark Adure Madhush's deportation. On the spot, Minister of Development Strategies and International Trade grilled from oil refinery to the bonds camp. Honorable Minister, not only Transparency International, the entire country is worried about yeah, this kind of they, deals. They don't have to because worry. Because you know, you have be, become no, a part Anubar. of many controversial issues in China. Yeah. Another vote, another defeat. UK Parliament yet again fails to find a Brexit consensus. The House should have a chance to consider again the options on Wednesday. All this and much more coming up on First at Nine this Tuesday, the 2nd of April 2019. From Ada Verona, this is Ada Verona First at Nine. Live from Studio 24 in Colombo. Good evening and welcome to First at Nine. I'm Thamdike Magan. Now let's start with your local stories. Non-governmental organization Human Rights Watch is urging the Sri Lankan government to drop plans to resume executions which would end an unofficial 43-year moratorium on the country. The calls come after President Maithripala Sirisena's recent statement where he said the death or the dates rather for the death penalty's implementation is set. The NGO is also unhappy with President Sirisena praising the drug eradication campaign of the Philippines President Rodrigo Duterte. President Maithripala Sirisena recently noted that a date is set to resume the death penalty specifically relating to drug traffickers. Whilst calling on the Sri Lankan government to continue the unofficial 43-year moratorium on the death penalty in Sri Lanka, non-governmental organization Human Rights Watch revisited President Maithripala Sirisena's visit to the Philippines in January where the head of state called President Duterte's war on drugs an example to the world. South Asia Director of Human Rights Watch, Meenakshi Ganguly, was quoted on its website as saying, President Sirisena's decision to restore the death penalty because he was inspired by the Philippines' murderous drug war may be the worst possible justification and would violate international law. It also said that the alleged deterrent effect of the death penalty has been repeatedly debunked and that imposing the death penalty for drug offences would violate Sri Lanka's international human rights obligations. It highlighted the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, to which Sri Lanka is party, as stating in Article 6 on the right to life that the death penalty may be imposed only for the most serious crimes. The Human Rights Watch quoted the UN Human Rights Committee as saying crimes not resulting directly and indirectly in death, such as drug offences, although serious in nature, can never serve as the basis within the framework of Article 6 for the imposition of the death penalty. Now the bill to amend the Chapter 203 of the Motor Traffic Act has been gazetted by the government in order to increase minimum fines imposed on seven motor traffic offences. As per the Gazette notification issued under the orders of the Minister of Transport and Civil Aviation, minimum fines for these traffic offences, including driving without a valid driving licence, driving under the influence of liquor and drugs, and driving a vehicle without a valid insurance, have been increased to 25,000 rupees. The Ministry said that the amended fines will be presented to Parliament very soon. The negligence by drivers and violation of traffic laws are identified as main reasons for the increase of road accidents over the past few years. As a result, the government had now decided to increase the minimum fine of seven traffic offences to 25,000 rupees. Accordingly, first-time offenders of driving without a vehicle license will have to pay an increased fine between 25,000 to 30,000 rupees, while second-time offenders will have to pay a fine between 30,000 to 50,000 rupees. First-time offenders of employing those without a vehicle license will also have to undergo an increased fine of 25,000 to 30,000 rupees, while second-time offenders will have to pay a fine between 30,000 to 50,000 rupees. 
Meanwhile, driving under the influence of liquor and drugs will have an increased fine between 25,000 to 30,000 rupees with an imprisonment period of not more than three months. Particular offenders' vehicle license will also be suspended for a period of not more than 12 months. Crossing a railway crossing carelessly will also have an increased fine between 25,000 to 30,000 rupees. Offenders who drive without a valid vehicle insurance, meanwhile, will have to pay an increased fine between 25,000 to 50,000 rupees and face imprisonment for a period of not more than one month. Meanwhile, the offence of violating the stipulated speed limit is fined under several categories, with the highest amount of fine at 25,000 rupees, along with a spot fine of 15,000 rupees. The offence of overtaking from the left side or undertaking will also be imposed with fines under several categories, with the highest amount at 25,000 rupees and a spot fine of 2,000 rupees. Now the committee stage debate of the budget 2019 was held for a 16th day today. The parliament debated the expenditure heads of the departments and institutions which come under the ministries of national integration, official languages, social progress and Hindu religious affairs as well as the development strategies and international trade. During the session today, views were also expressed by members of both the government and the opposition on the proposed oil refinery in Hambantota as well as the Singapore-Sri Lanka free trade agreement. I quote, Transparency International Sri Lanka believes the controversy surrounding the proposed U USG 3.85 billion oil refinery in Hambantota could have a negative impact on Sri Lanka's efforts to remove itself from the financial action task forces grey list of countries vulnerable to money laundering and terrorism finance. There is enough uh, of precautions that the banks take when this money is coming here. They can't, they are not bringing notes. So Transparency International need not get worried because this is coming through the banking sources and they do all the checking. No, Honourable Minister, not only Transparency International, the entire country is worried about yeah, this they kind can, of they, deals. They don't have to because, worry. Because, you know, you have be, become no, a part Anubal, of many controversial issues in yes, China. So we far, have what not about, done anything can I, wrong. Can I know what, and, the, what is and the, we will not do anything the, wrong. What is the status of the Fox Second Investment Board? Honourable Member, even I don't want to talk about it. The yeah, investment because came it's just coming. from your That's own same. people. The investment same came from Mr. Noel Selvanayagam. Who was campaigning in Hambantota with now Honorable the, Now the Prime Minister, Prime Minister, now the Prime so, Minister has I made two, the, two strong Honorable Chaman Rajapaksa is also aware of that. None of the investments are coming in. No, nobody is coming in. Everybody is pulling out the investments. In, in which capacity did you attend the breakfast meeting at the central bank with regards to the bonds camp? You attended? You were not a member of parliament at that time? Honorable Kabir Hashim attended? The former finance minister attended? All of you all attended. After that meeting only, this mega bond scam took place. I attended that meeting as an advice to the Prime Minister. Okay. We have very clearly stated, and the Bond Commission has accepted our statement, that Honorable Kabir Hashim oh, no. and I went there only to find out the money that was required to pay the contractors. of. So these are all baseless, false allegations. Please don't do that. Responsible for this bond scam. You all have not been cleared by the Bond Commission. Please, please don't mis mislead. Meanwhile, in response to a question raised by JVP MP Sunil Hadunneti regarding the Sri Lanka-Singapore Free Trade Agreement, Minister Malik Samaravikram emphasized that not a single complaint has been made following the implementation of the agreement 11 months ago. He, however, added that a committee has been appointed in this regard and it will not be hesitant to make necessary amendments if required. Now moving on with other local stories, President Maitri Palasirisena last week revealed the government's decision to do away with the Grade 5 scholarship examination. The decision, however, was criticised by some factions claiming that the move would shut a gateway to so-called popular schools. Undeterred by the criticism, the head of state today gave further clarification to the thought process behind the decision and defended the move. President Maitripala Sirisena declared the three-storied building at the Subharati Mahamatya Vidyale in Godagama open last evening, which also features an auditorium. We said the Grade 5 scholarship will be scrapped. 
The government took the decision to scrub the scholarship after preparing an alternative for that. If not, we are not going to decide it this year and instead do it next year. The Grade 5 scholarship examination was launched so students from rural schools could be given a good education with a monthly allowance in a bid to improve the knowledge and prepare them for future examinations. What has happened now is that this has become the only gateway to enter what are considered popular schools. The plan for the students after doing away with the scholarship examination is to hold one and direct them to special streams depending on their talents. What we expect through scrapping the Grade 5 scholarship examination is to prepare them for a better future. This procedure is done by specialists in education, not politicians. Meanwhile, senior lecturer of sociology, Dr. M. T. M. Mahis, says that an alternative for the Grade 5 scholarship examination should be carefully chosen, adding that it could lead to difficult political as well as social issues. Speaking to First at Nine today, Dr. Mahis went on to say that authorities should also ensure access for social mobility for students living in rural areas of the island. As a sociologist, I, I do believe that scholarship exam uh, has been uh, doing a lot of positive and constructive services to the poor children in the country. We know that uh, there is a negative aspect of scholarship exam, that is the it's a unnecessary examination, stress and burden on children. But we have to find a, a proper solution how to minimize the uh, stress and uh, the competition among students rather than uh, abolishing the scholarship exam all of a sudden. Even if we are going to abolishing the scholarship exam, we need to have a good alternative solution for this exam in order to safeguard and protect the opportunity of these rural poor students of this country. Otherwise, it's going, it's going to be another issue. It's going to be another political problem. So therefore, we have to be very much critically concerned about what are we going to propose as an alternative suggestion for the scholarship exam. Moving on with more political issues, Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe says that the opposition had worked against the proceedings of the local bodies by defeating the expenditure heads of the Ministry of Provincial Councils and Local Government. The Premier expressed these views at an event held in Colombo today. The 371 million rupee multi-storey car park in Maharagama was declared open by Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe today. මේ නගර සභා පත්තු නැද්දි ගිය අවුරුද්දේ අපේ ಪಕ್ಷ පරාජයට පත් වුණා මොකද්ද මේ ආණ්ඩුව කරලා තියෙන්නේ මේ ගොල්ල ප්‍රතිපලයක් පෙන්නන්නේ නැහැ 2018ට ඔන්න පෙන්නන්නම් කියලා අවුරුද්දක් අවුරුද්දක් ගිහින් දැන් ප්‍රතිපල පෙන්නන්නේ හැම පැත්තෙම මේ ආණ්ඩුව අපි හැම තැනින්ම ප්‍රතිපල පෙන්න අපි සැලසුම් මනෝ වැඩ කරපු නිසා මේ නගර සභා වලට මොකද සිදු වෙලා තියෙන්නේ අයවැය සාමාන්‍යයෙන් විපක්ෂ බලන්නේ ආණ්ඩුවේ වැඩ කටයුතු වල තියෙන මුදල් අඩු කරන්න අපි වාද කරලා ඡන්දය අරගෙන මොකද්ද අපි පැරදුවේ කොහෙන්ද මුදල් කැපුවේ මුදල් කැපුවේ නගර සභා වලටයි ප්‍රාදේශ සභා වලට ඒ කියන්නේ තමන් මෛත්‍රී විපක්ෂයේ කිව්වා මේ නගර සභා වලින් වැඩක් නැහැ කියලා උවමනාවක් නැහැ කියලා දැන් අපි පහස වෙනද ක්‍රියා කරන්නේ නැත්තම් සතයක් නැති වෙනවා අප්‍රේල් මාසේ ගෙවන්න Opposition leader Mahindra Rajpaksha in the meantime stated that they received the support of the backbenchers of the United National Party to defeat the expenditure heads of the Ministry of Provincial Councils and Local Government. Opposition leader expressed these views during a discussion held with newspaper editors at the office of the opposition leader today. <laughs> विशेष कमी 
විටියක්වත් කරලා තීන්දුවක් අරගෙන තිබුණා මේ රක්ෂිත වනාන්තර කපන්නේ පදිංචි කරන්නේ පා කියලා විගනාධිපති වරයාගේ රිපෝට් එකේ තියෙනවා මම හිතන්නේ විස්තරේ දාලා මිනිසුන්ට අවශ්‍ය වූ ඉඩම් පදිංචි කිරීමේ ප්‍රමාණයයි අනවශ්‍ය විදියට කැලෑ කපා පදිංචි කිරීම අය අතර ලොකු වෙනසක් නැහැ ඊට පස්සේ මේ පෞගිය කාලේ තමයි ඊතුරු ටික මේ කැලෑව ගිහිල්ලා පදිංචි වුණා ආරක්ෂාවට අක්‍ර 10ක් විතර කපනවා මොනවා වුණත් වනාන්තර කපන්න කාටවත් අයිතියක් නැහැ Now two more suspects were arrested in Dubai along with notorious drug kingpin Mark Andre Madhush at a party that involved drugs were deported to Sri Lanka last night. Police media spokesperson SP1 Gunasekara said that criminal investigation department took them into custody for questioning upon their arrival at the Bandar Naik International Airport early this morning. Police media spokesperson also added that one suspect will be released during the day after questioning by the CID officials and other will be produced before the Nigambo magistrates court tomorrow as he has some connections with the pending criminal cases. Dubai police arrested Mark Andre Madhush and 30 others including several prominent underworld figures and a popular Sri Lankan singer at a party which involved drugs on the 5th of February. Following the investigations, Dubai police took steps to deport six persons arrested along with Mark Andre Madhush and two more suspects were deported last night and they arrived in Sri Lanka early this morning. Mohammad Siddiq Mohammad Sham and Veera Singh Halanka Sajid Perera are the two individuals who arrived in Sri Lanka today and the officials of the Criminal Investigation Department arrested them for questioning at the airport. Police media spokesperson SP Ruan Gunasekara said that the duo was questioned at length by CID officials to look for any connections to the drug mafia or any criminal activities. Only 2 out of 6 suspects deported earlier were released after questioning and other 4 were remanded as they were wanted by police over a number of criminal charges. Accordingly, singer Amal Pereira's son, Nadi Mal Pereira and Anderson Fernandez were released by police. Now, Royal Navy frigate HMS Montrose docked at the port of Colombo for the first time today for a short logistics stop. She was welcomed by the Sri Lankan Navy in line with naval traditions. We had first at nine's Shanela Fernando at the port reporting on the arrival of the frigate as well as its mission. HMS Montrose is the 11th of 13 Type 23 Duke class frigates. Montrose was built by Yarrow Shipbuilders in 1989 and was launched by Lady Edith Rifkind in 1992. Named after the Duke of Montrose, she was commissioned into the Royal Navy in 1994. Having once been the flagship of the 6th Frigate Squadron, HMS Montrose is now part of the Devonport Flotilla based in Devonport Dockyard in Plymouth. With a length of 133 meters and a height of 26.6 meters, this Duke-class frigate can sail the seas with a speed of 52 km per hour and has covered a range of 7,500 nautical miles. Montrose has been awarded the Fleet Effectiveness Trophy for Best Frigate in the Royal Navy in 2014. Before her current voyage, Montrose had worked with the navies of the United States, Canada and other regional South American countries in the Joint Interagency Task Force South. She has also contributed to the Combined Task Force 150, which is a multinational coalition naval task force working under the 25-nation coalition of combined maritime forces in the region of Horn of Africa and North Arabia Sea to support operations in the Indian Ocean which conduct maritime security operations. We're delighted to have HMS Montrose visit Colombo as part of its long journey around the world, visiting various parts of Asia Pacific and the Indian Ocean. It's a demonstration of the UK's commitment to global security, but also an opportunity to deepen the relationship between the UK and Sri Lanka. And we think there's plenty of scope for close working together on how to tackle uh, the sort of challenges that many countries face around the region, but also globally from transnational crime, from the pernicious threat of narcotics and people smuggling. Sri Lanka is the final stop before Montrose reached Bahrain, becoming the first Royal Navy frigate to be forward deployed to the UK Naval Support Facility in Bahrain until 2023. And this is part of our global deployment, having left the United Kingdom in October last year and passage across the Pacific and through the China Seas and we're now here in the Indian Ocean en route to our final location of Bahrain where this ship will be forward deployed for the next few years. 
Once in Bahrain, HMS Montrose will be carrying out an array of joint security operations, including counter piracy, counter narcotics, and boarding operations in the effort to support allies in the region as well as to protect the UK's interests. Now, which Sri Lankan fuel price is set to go up on the 10th of every month, it's worth taking a keen eye on the fuel prices or crude prices in the global market. So stay tuned. You are watching Sri Lanka's number one news channel. This is Other Therana 24. Welcome back. You're watching First at Nine. Now, oil hit a 2019 high above 69 US dollars a barrel today on the prospect that more sanctions against Iran and further Venezuelan disruptions could deepen an OPEC led supply cut. And as the market becomes less worried, that demand may slow. The United States is considering more sanctions against Iran, whose oil exports have been halved by existing measures, while a key crude terminal in Venezuela, also under US sanctions, has halted operations again. Brent crude rose 10 cents to $69.11 a barrel, ha uh, having touched $69.50, the highest since mid-November. U.S. crude was up 11 cents at $61.70 after rising above $62 for the first time since early November. Further supply losses from Iran and Venezuela would widen an OPEC-led production cut that took effect in January, designed to prevent a price-sapping rise in inventories. Now, the all share prices index uh, ended rather in uh, ended 0.19 percent higher at 5,578.43 today, its highest close since the 19th of March. The benchmark stock index rose 0.31 percent last week, recording its first weekly gain in eight weeks, and it has declined 7.8 percent so far this year. The market turnover was 433.7 million rupees, less than this year's daily average of 644.1 million rupees and the foreign earnings were a net 16.8 million rupees worth of shares. Let's now cross over to Amanda Lokogamage from First Capital Holdings for a full report on the how the bulls performed today. The overall market sentiment was slowly turning positive with investors broadly on the buy side. Bond markets saw buying interest though rates remain unchanged. In the bond auction, 2022 and 2023 maturities we accepted that weighted average yields of 10.72% and 11.24%. The stock market saw a green day for the fourth consecutive day with net, net uh, foreign inflow of 17 million rupees for the uh, third consecutive day. Now, the Sri Lankan rupee closed firmer today as more foreign investors purchased government securities while inward remittances remained high ahead of the Singhal and Tamil New Year celebrations. The rupee ended at 176 rupees and 66 cents against the US dollar, which gained 2.09% in the last six sessions and 4.8% so far this year as exporters converted dollars and foreign investors purchased government securities amid stabling or more like stabilizing investor confidence after the country repaid 1 billion US dollars uh, sovereign foreign uh, uh, sovereign bond in mid-January. Now let's now take a look at how the Sri Lankan rupee traded against other currencies around the globe. We've got the latest on the European unfolding saga, which is the Brexit on the other side of this break. Stay tuned. You are watching Sri Lanka's number one news channel. This is Other Therana 24.
Welcome back. You're watching First at Nan. It's time to look at news from overseas. Now, for a second time since Friday, no MP proposed Brexit option won clear backing in the House of Commons, with the latest voting happening late yesterday. All four proposals on how Britain could leave the European Union fail to secure a majority vote, which makes a no-deal scenario very much a reality. European Commission Chief Jean-Claude Juncker, meanwhile, continued to be prickly towards the indecis indecisiveness of British lawmakers, saying the mythical Sphinx is an open book compared to British politicians. British lawmakers yesterday voted to turn down all four proposed Brexit options on the table. The British government has until the 12th of this month to decide how Britain will leave the European Union. MPs voted 261 to 282 to reject the proposal that the United Kingdom stays in the single market and negotiates the customs union with the EU. Meanwhile, MPs voted 191 to 292 to turn down the idea to give lawmakers power to stop a no-deal Brexit. They voted 280 to 292 to oppose the proposal that a confirmative public vote will be conducted on Brexit, while also voting 273 to 276 to reject the proposal to negotiate a permanent customs union with the EU. It's disappointing that no solution has won a majority this evening, but I remind the House that the Prime Minister's unacceptable deal has been overwhelmingly rejected three times. The margin of defeat for one of the options tonight was very narrow indeed and the Prime Minister's deal has been rejected by very large majorities on three occasions. If it's good enough for the Prime Minister to have three chances at her deal, then I suggest that possibly the House should have a chance to consider again the options that we had before us today in a debate on Wednesday so that the House can succeed where the Prime Minister has failed in presenting a credible economic relationship with Europe for the future that prevents us crashing out with no deal. European Commission Chief Jean-Claude Juncker meanwhile slammed the Brexit process yesterday, saying the mythical Sphinx is an open book compared with British politicians. The European Commission had also named former British Prime Minister David Cameron one of the great destroyers of modern times for launching the Brexit referendum campaign in June of 2016. Prime Minister May is seeking a fourth vote on her withdrawal agreement, which has been rejected by the Parliament three times since January. Meanwhile, EU's chief negotiator Michel Barnier has said that a no-deal Brexit is now more likely but can still be avoided. Barnier said a long extension to the UK's current April 12th exit date carried significant risks for the EU and that a strong justification would be needed before the EU would agree. Now, NASA has called India's destruction of a satellite a terrible thing that could threaten the International Space Station. The space agency's chief, Jim Bridgenstein, said that the risk of debris colliding with the International Space Station had risen by 44% over 10 days due to the test. He, however, said that the space station is still safe and it will be maneuvered if the need arises. India is the fourth country to have carried such a test. Now, Prime Minister Narendra Modi announced the test with great fanfare on the 27th of last month, saying it had established India as a space superpower. In an address to employees, NASA's chief said that it had identified 400 pieces of orbital debris and was tracking 60 pieces larger than 10 centimeters in diameter. He added that 24 of those pieces posed a potential risk to the ISS. Venezuela's Supreme Court has asked for opposition leader Juan Guaido to be stripped of his parliamentary immunity, which could lead to him being jailed. The pro-government constituent assembly is expected to back the request. Guaido declared himself interim leader in January, gaining the support of more than 50 countries, including the US. But President Nicolas Maduro has major allies too and retains the crucial backing of the military. Amid power struggle between the two, uh, Venezuela has seen growing street protests over a lack of water and electricity. The authorities have said they will shorten the working day and keep schools closed due to the power cuts. Yesterday, the electricity minister was replaced with an electrical engineer. The government has claimed that the blackouts are the result of sabotage to force Maduro from office.
Now moving on to America, a second woman has accused former U.S. Vice President Joe Biden of inappropriate touching as the leading Democrat mulls a White House bid. Amy Lapos has said Biden had touched her face with both hands and rubbed noses with her a decade ago. The allegation comes after another woman, Lucy Flores, said Biden kissed her on the back of her head at a campaign event. Biden has said he did not believe he has ever acted inappropriately. The former Delaware senator, who served as Barack Obama's vice president from 2009 to 2017, is seen as a possible frontrunner in the phrase for the Democratic presidential nomination. Time for sports and it is cricket. Now, Sri Lanka Cricket yesterday announced that the Super Provincial 50 over tournament 2019 will be held from this Thursday to the 11th of this month. The tournament will take place at Dambul and Palekale International Stadiums. Addressing media, Secretary to the Sri Lanka Cricket Mohanda Silva also said that Sri Lankan Premier League tournament, known as LPL, which did not get underway last year, will take place between August to September. Sri Lanka cricket is ready to hold the Super Provincial One Day Tournament, which will be used as the criterion for selection to the 2019 Cricket World Cup in England. Sri Lanka cricket also invested around 60 million rupees for the tournament. The four teams contesting in the tournament will be led by Dinesh Chandimal, Lasit Malinga, Dimut Karuna Ratna, and Angelo Matthews. This tournament has four teams. Each team has 22. Each team will play three matches. And on the 10th, there will be third and fourth places will play on the 10th to select the third position. And then the 11th will be the finals. Fourth, first and second teams will play to elect the champions. The Super Provincial Tournament, which is also a precursor in preparation to our World Cup activities ahead of the Cricket World Cup 2019. We are confident that this tournament will produce results in order to achieve desired objective of not only giving the players a platform to display their skills, but also the opportunity to the selectors to select the best team for the Cricket World Cup. We are confident that we have the talent and we have the ability to create a significant impact in the upcoming World Cup tournament. A particular tournament because we've been talking about the very important in terms of the provincial tournament. Yes, that's right. Actually, we are already set the ball um, rolling. So hopefully, August, September this year, uh, we will see the uh, tournament taking place. And that's it from all of us here at First Nine. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.